Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. I'm Heather Burton Santi, laughing at myself because I pushed the uh, little thing on the taskbar to show the recording options and then just stared at the recording options, wondering why isn't, nothing was happening. So now we're recording. Uh, welcome. And today uh, with me is Bethany Corey. Hello. And Carol Garboden Murray. Hi, everyone. Hey, we've been talking about this one. For a long time. Ironically, we're going to talk about slow knowledge, and it has taken us a really long time to get to the point. It's been a slow conversation. To Very get slow. To, yes. To record about slow knowledge. Um, so the book is called Slow Knowledge and the Unhurried Child Time for Slow Pedagogies in Early Childhood Education by Allison Clark. It's part of Routledge's, um, Routledge, Routledge, I'm never sure how to say it contesting early childhood book series which is fantastic the whole series yeah. is really mm. um and i think maybe i i must i think i follow allison clark on twitter and she oh, she good. tweeted about it and i think that's how i found out about it and then Wait. like i think i i like i followed the um Froebel trust the Froebel trust uh, had a, yeah. a little talk on facebook yeah. and i clicked clicked on that and found her giving a talk with, I think, Peter Moss. Ooh, love Peter Moss. <laughs> so if Peter Moss is on, I listen. <laughs> um, okay, so let's start with the quote, which is about being with, and this is a quote, Alison Clark is quoting Sylvia Kind uh, from an interview. Um, and I don't, it, I guess, is that, I think Sylvia is a teacher that she was working with. Yes, it it's like part of the research. Parts of, parts of her research. Thank you. So um, Sylvia said in an interview in November 2020, it's the idea of being with, I think that would be the essence of a slow pedagogy and that being with isn't always slow in terms of time. Again, there could be intensities and vibrancies and things erupting. It's finding the rhythm of the children you're working with, the adults you are working with, the materials you are working with, it's how do we be with others, be with ideas, not just as if we stand outside of it. To me, I guess it was the idea of being with. Um, so Carol, you actually chose this quote for our starting point. So I'm going to put you on the spot to talk about why that of we're, we're talking about just part one in this episode Great. of all of part one. Why was that the, the thing that you thought would be a good starting point? I thought it was a good starting point because it defines sort of, it defines slow for me because, you know, there's a lot at the, at the intro about resisting the hurried childhood. Mm -hmm. And I think when you break it down into a pedagogy or practice, um, people would think, what are they talking about? Uh, moving at the snail's pace yeah. or what does this mean? So I like this idea that it's being attuned to children. Yeah. And I like this idea that it is the child's time, the child's pace, and it can be exciting. It can be yeah. erupting. Sometimes it's really fast. Yeah. I and love the, I, the imagery of the erupting that, that she yeah. had in here is yeah. thinking about, I've definitely had moments of eruption, <laughs> not myself, but just like the, the space and the environment and the interactions when I've been with children. Um, and having that freedom to like yeah. tune with the children okay. and follow their pace or like, yeah. or being, it, to me, it felt like, you know, those moments when you're like teaching and you're like, ah, oh, the pace, it yeah. feels right. And then you look at each other and say, oh, I think we should let playtime go for another 15 minutes, even though we were, we're, we were getting ready for lunch. It's uh -huh. that, that attunement, right? Yeah. That tone, that, that um, letting it truly be a child's world. Yeah. And um, thinking about time as a material, right? I, I just think that's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Bethany, do you want to add anything in there or? Not yet. Okay. I just, I'm... Before, before I jumped in, I'm trying to be aware. <laughs> Sorry. That Carol and I could go back and forth. <laughs> I know. And I'm having a opening. slow time warming up. So <laughs> go ahead. Okay. I, I love the idea of time as a material um, uh, because I think, one of the things she talks a lot in the early part of the book about accelerated childhoods being a concern. And, and for me that, you know, that's the, just that idea that we aren't really, we're taking years of childhood away from children with yeah. our intense focus on getting ready for the next thing. 
um, or meeting this mythical idea of child's potential. Um, I, and you've both seen, heard this on in our chat groups probably already, but yesterday I was at a panel discussion um, where essentially the message of one of the panelists was, if we wait until we get to kindergarten, it's too late. And, mm -hmm. and for me, the, the idea just sat on my heart as, you know, really heavy. And the idea that we were going to steal two or three years of childhood and put the burden of all these social ills that they were saying could be, could be solved by starting school earlier. Yeah. Putting that burden on the shoulders of a 36 month old child um, really broke my heart. And, and I kept thinking about this idea of slow knowledge while mm -hmm. I was listening to them talk about that. I just um, opened up randomly while you were saying that to where uh, Allison says the future intrudes on the present in a sometimes forceful way. Yeah. And yeah, you know, what are we missing when we hurry up and get to the next? Yeah. I love thing. that idea of it, the intrusion, right? And like, we have to defend the child's time. We have to mm -hmm. stand guard. And then, and then like, if you think about time as a material that we can use time. So, so like how beautiful it is to have a schedule that is, both flexible and predictable, right? So we build in these flows, these rhythms in the day and the children learn that after playtime, we have lunchtime mm -hmm. or after lunchtime, we go outside. So so to, to, to think about that, using time as a material, if you, if you, can, if you can figure out how to be in, in tune with children, Mm -hmm. and let the time sort of hold you. I see it as a boundary where kids can really be kids, right? But it does protect us in some ways, knowing what comes next, mm -hmm. knowing there's a rhythm and knowing that we move. I think it's, what is it like Waldorf that talks about breathing in and out mm -hmm. that, you know, knowing that they're, uh, the, the, the time offers us comfort, um, the time offers us space to get to know each other. It get it, it, we we protect playtime because mm -hmm. we really believe in it. I don't know, just thinking about how how we can use time is is exciting because it is kind of ephemeral and it's not something that really comes up a lot with pedagogy. And I think that's why I was excited about this book. And wow. I know people, a lot of people don't like pedagogy. I'm thinking about Tiffany. Tiffany, but... just don't listen to this episode. <laughs> okay, Tiffany. Um, so we just talking about the art, like the art of teaching, right? Like yeah. how the art and science of teaching. So how, how can we, how can time be on our side? I think it does come up in our conversations at, at one level where when we're talking about like the very simple, like this is deep. This book is pretty deep stuff, but it can plug right into um, the real everyday world. Uh, if we, you know, we just have to work to make those connections. I know for me, that's why it was a slow read because I had to, <laughs> I had to put a lot of, of that connecting thought in it, but, but talking about like thinking about children's daily schedules, I've, I've been looking at typical childcare schedules lately. Um, I don't even remember what project that was for, but, um, and just how much we try to pack in and how, how short the time periods are and how much we focus on the clock um, and what you're talking, you know, and we say children need structure. That's why we have this because children need mm -hmm. structure. Well, what they need is that predictability that you're talking about. And we mm -hmm. can get there fast or slow, you know, whatever, whatever tempo you want to talk about here. Um, but when we're, when we're using this slow knowledge approach, it's like we're being intentional about when to switch to the next thing. The predictability, yeah. the flow can still be there, but we're not just saying, oh, uh, well, it's 10, 15. So it's time to be done with that. We're, it, we're looking at the day and saying, it seems like we're done with this, or it seems like some people are ready for the next thing yeah. and, and, and moving through like that more than just being driven by the clock, mm -hmm. the clock and time are not the same thing. Yeah. And you have to, you have to have a different outlook then on 
what your group what is going to look like. You know, I think about um, when I was a nanny, um, the little girl went to a two day a week, like five hour program uh-huh. and they had 14 different items on their schedule to get through in for five, five hours. hours. Right. And most of them, you had to move to a different room. Mm. So you were, you know, you had all of these transitions you know, maybe 15 minutes of time in one space, but you had to go and do the music class and Bible class and art class and, you know, all of these things. And, and so, you know, for them, time was, it was just that structure. They didn't have any, like, you know, they talk about like expansive time where you can just, you know, go and maybe it takes up a big amount of time, your activity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but that sounds miserable teacher for teachers oh, and children to have I that know. many things I, to get through in five hours. And I bet yeah. there were transition behavior issues that I bet oh, yeah. there was a they, lot of they teacher had, stress they had to the walk on, efforts. on like the, the carpets had like borders yeah. and you had to walk on the border. You couldn't step off. I mean, it was, it was wow. hard for me yeah. to, to let her go there. That's that's stressful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a big imposition. And that, that's the other thing about thinking about time, the child's pace mm-hmm. is that it taps into the intelligence of children because they do live in the here and now. Right. Yeah. Um, and, there's this, and, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say it's that it lets, it's that process versus product almost right. It's the, the process of moving through time or the product of staying on schedule. Right. Sort of when I, you know, when you're thinking about a daily schedule or the flow of a day. It says lingering in places and really being in and attending to things, paying attention to things, being in a way that you're not there to do something. Mm -hmm. You're there to be and to listen. I like that pausing and lingering, Mm -hmm. you know, because anyone who's just been able to have that that wonderful meandering with a, with a toddler and just, you know, every step they take, there's something to linger over. Yeah. But even just th- taking the children out of it for a minute in our role as teachers or, or providers or carers, whatever, whatever term we want to give ourselves, um, just as humans, that's hard for a lot of people, like, yeah. especially um, culturally speaking, um, the the dominant narrative of our culture seems to be always be busy and any time not spent being busy is wasted time and we measure busyness by um, observable effort and by fatigue right by the stress it causes <laughs> so no. oh if we we lost Bethany if we can't if we can't do that just for ourselves it's going to be even harder to uh, to allow us to allow for that when we're in our groups with children. Yeah. It's like that we live in that measurable, we think we live in a measurable linear kind of time scape. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of an illusion really. Right. Or like we're going to run out of time. That's a silly phrase. Like yeah. if, if you, yeah. like, you know, if I'm driving to the doctor and I have to be there by one fifteen, or they're not going to see me, then I could run out of time. But in this yeah. bigger picture, if we're worried about running out of time to do things, that's adding a stressor that's not necessary, I think. Yeah. And when you think about the way the child develops and the child learns mm-hmm. um, the the deep, the depth, right? And that mm-hmm. it's not linear. And that yeah. they, she referred to Bruner's, um, the temporal discussion um, and Bruner's concept of a spiral. A spiral. Curriculum. I'm so yeah. new to Bruner and I need to get into it now because the spiral curriculum keeps yeah. coming into my my orbit lately and the universe is telling me to get my Jerome Bruner book off the shelf that's been sitting there for for years probably but yeah uh, yeah, on page 15 she says um this is Emma Dyer being interviewed there's this pressure in schools to perform and to be able to do certain things at certain times hit certain milestones at certain points but then not necessarily developmental milestones milestones much more milestones in terms of what they can achieve and what they can demonstrate so it's this idea of slow knowledge then I think impacts how we move through each day, but also how we, and I think you were just talking about this, how we see 
development. It's always yeah. a race. It's always yeah. who can hit the milestones first or on time and yeah. how, how late is too late. And um, that, I think that can interfere with providing spaces for children to linger, uh, you know, f- sort of literally just stay in the same spot or metaphysically <laughs> to linger and yeah. have a spiritual experience um, yeah. in their space or in their day. Yeah. And I think naming it like naming it like a spiral, like if we are observing children and, and maybe we're, we're grasping with our role, you know, mm-hmm. like maybe, maybe we're writing down some of the questions they ask or some of the phrases they say, um, maybe we're taking a photo of that, that moment when they're pausing and looking closely at yeah. something and then bringing that back, like saying, Oh, do you remember yesterday you guys were talking about this? You know, it doesn't have to move on. Right. Yeah. It's like, you know, you think if you don't catch it, then it's gone. It's like, it's slippery. Like there's, there's just a hundred really precious, amazing things children say and do and discover and create every day. And uh-huh. it, it's gone. Like yeah. we can bring it back to them, you know? So there can be that sort of pedagogy of listening, um, reflecting, bringing the conversation back, Mm -hmm. you know, yesterday you guys spent a lot of time around this puddle and, you know, the, what, what were you thinking? And this this is what you said, and, and this is what we did. And Mm -hmm. I wonder what, I wonder what's going to happen today. Inhabiting that for yourself. Yeah. It just feels more authentic to me. And I'm always looking these days for what's more authentic, what are more authentic ways of, of doing the work with children and letting them be children. I, I was just talking to Suzanne Axelson, um, as I told you before we recorded, and we talked a little bit about calendar time. Mm. And I think what you're describing, talking about what you noticed yesterday and how much time they spent on it and, and, you know, bringing, you know, talking about it in terms of the past and, and now is a much more authentic way of helping children with a concept of time. If we feel like that's something we need to help them with, that that's on our checklist or whatever than random blurting out of numbers until eventually somebody gets the right day <laughs> and yeah. and saying that's that's learning about time um yeah because- and think about I like talk about it I think Beth- Bethany said an intrusion like what an intrusion to like be rehearsing the calendar yeah. <laughs> for, for a child who is yeah. living in here now like we, it seems so out of sync with what we know about children and what their yeah. interests are. And, and it's like, what an imposition into their day when they are there yeah. and they are fully like present and yeah. in flow. And let's talk about today and tomorrow and the next day. It's a different kind. That whole calendar idea is just so, uh, they talk about schoolification in this yes. too, which yeah. I love having that word come Me into into our yeah. discussions more and more because we I think we got it from I think Peter Gray was talking about and Peter probably. Um, Peter Moss probably probably yeah who knows but it's a good one I love to bring in uh but so I, I talk a lot like when I'm teaching um or even you know doing a workshop or whatever I talk about how how we develop from the neck down and then from the mm-hmm. inside out physically mm-hmm. yes. um and I think as, as I was listening to you, I was like, well, maybe this is true. And maybe I want to say spiritually, but I'm not sure that's the right word yet, because this is just like an initial thought I'm processing. But if we're, if children are able to be here in the now, that's like their, their core, and then they can start to experience all the other elements of time. But right now they're in the now, you know, now is what they're focusing on because they develop from the inside out Yeah, in in whatever domain we want to say that might be. I was thinking about that with the teacher today because we were talking about the kids who have turned four and they're they they think it's really funny. For some reason, I started a game with them where they pretend like they're babies, and I'm like, "What are all the babies crying for?" I think <laughs> so they pretend like they're babies, and she, yeah. and we were talking about that concept of time. We said, "Isn't it interesting? Like this is the time now. They've just turned four. They can kind of they can they're starting to create a history. They can kind of uh, look. This yeah. is like they didn't ever have a reference for before and." now and uh-huh. later but they're now like really becoming aware of their 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 change and that they used to be a baby maybe they remember their third birthday now that they just had their fourth birthday uh-huh. 
but that they didn't have that construction of time. They had no reference point, right? right. So that time helped. does move so slowly for them, right? They don't notice. It's mm-hmm. like, uh, it's like our own children. We don't notice how much they're growing and changing until we take them to see grandma who hasn't seen them yeah. forever and notices that, that, that jump they've had. So maybe it's kind of the same for those four-year-olds pretending to be babies. They're just in the yeah. middle of all that time. Yeah. <laughs> so they don't notice. Right. And after. Like, yeah, they're so in the midst of it and they have no reference for the past. And, and yeah, I like that idea of it being like that you really have to inhabit the here and now before you can begin to understand the yeah. past and future. Yeah. And that or that's what's coming thing. next and all yeah. that. Yeah. What a what an incredible part of childhood. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's uh, yes. Great, great that, intelligence. I'm just looking through now what I've got highlighted. We lost Bethany. She texted and said she had something oh, no. okay. pop up. So, um, uh, but at the end of this chapter on clock time, so this is on page 23 at the very end, um, she says productivity and lost time may not be measured on a two faced time piece in schools and early childhood provision, but is the pressure there? Nevertheless, this raises questions about whose time is being lost that of the adult or of the children and lost from what? And I thought, um, I thought that was really interesting. I mean, yeah, you know, I'm kind of always thinking in terms of adult centric versus child centric and whatever's in the middle. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're so good at binary, but we don't really get into the, the middle, the gray, um, you know, we're, we're much more comfortable dealing with black and white, um, that that stood out to me whose time is really being lost and lost to what what does that really mean yeah and I don't know that I have an answer I'm just saying maybe Allison has an answer and wants to call us up yeah. us. <laughs> thank you Allison for writing this book it is deep like every page really gets you thinking yeah. it's, it's a little book yeah it's- yeah I got it and it was I was like this is going to be such an easy read yeah. I'm going to quick. And I meant quick in, you know, thinking about time again, but I meant this is going to take me no time at all to read. Um, but it, it, it stops me every now and again. Um, so look, this is just, uh, this piece that I, that I highlighted and want to share is, um, is it? uh, it's on 17. Oh, so 17. I, do, I, you know, I want to hear what, what you think about it maybe, but also I just really love the language of it. Yeah. Um, this is an interview again, Julia Oliviera Formachino, maybe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so then the pressures for schoolification, instead of looking at preschool as an avenue, a pathway to help children to research the world, to research with their 100 languages, normally the, ten- the tendency is to answer through schoolification. So she's talking about the acceleration of children's lives because of the preschool pressures and um it's, it, it becomes an avenue to get to what's next instead of a pathway to help children research the world with their hundred languages. Yeah. Wow. And I think that sounds really beautiful when I think about it in real life, it feels like it would probably be messy and, yeah. and, and the adult would feel like maybe they're not in control and it might be harder to articulate to an outsider what's happening when children are researching their own, uh, uh, what was it? Was it pathways? Mm-hmm. Just the world to research the world with their own hundred languages. Yeah. Um, but it also would take some, some measure of a really skilled adult. So often when we think about or talk about letting go of schoolification practices, mm-hmm. the adults, the teachers wonder, well, then what's my role? It's just chaos. Yeah. What's yeah. my role? What do I do with all my expertise? Um, how do I contribute? What does it matter then what adult is in there? Um, but, but then a sentence like this comes along Yeah. says, well, look how deep it really can be when you feel like you're letting go of control or you feel like you're losing your, your teacher identity. They're research, researching the world with their hundred languages and you have so many opportunities to support that. Yeah. Just and to, know, that. to try to understand what their language yeah. is, right? Their yeah. movement, their, their, uh, their, their art, their, 
their way of uh, manipulating materials and moving things around. Mm -hmm. Before that, someone says, I find that this is another quote because she did a lot. (laughs) Yeah, this is a research interview heavy chapter. Yeah. I like to sit back for a while and just watch. And I find that sometimes I'm being pressured by other staff to do something. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting and observing. I'm listening. I'm watching their actions. I'm thinking, this is what I need to be doing. And I feel as though some staff are trying to rush on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. What are you going to put out today? Whereas I would rather a child have time and time again to revisit. So they become confident and they develop their own explorations so that they can plan something that would be meaningful to them. Mm-hmm. And she said, she says, it's as if the teacher needs to steal back time in order to sit with the children and respond to their actions. Mm. There's so much pressure that we feel mm-hmm. to be performative <laughs> and performing. Um, yeah. and, and maybe we're not comfortable we might sort of have an instinct I know there's been times in my career where I would have had an instinct to sit and be and feel like it was okay and just observe and be part of uh but felt like I couldn't if someone came in right now and said what are you doing I wouldn't be able to articulate it uh the way that this um this interviewee did yeah um, but it, it's like every skill, it takes practice, right? If we're yeah. going to, if we're going to say, this is a value we have to slow things down, um, and really be, and really observe and really let them be in the now, right. uh, how, how are we going to talk about that with other people? And how would you, I mean, that's why I like, I'm so excited that, that we have this book because if we, if we, cause we can name it, you know, mm-hmm. something, yeah. Like we we'll call about. it slow knowledge yeah, or slow pedagogy. Slow I yep. really believe in slow knowledge and we're really, and it seems like, I mean, this part two is we're going to get into more materials and yeah. stories and all that kind of stuff, meals and all that. Yeah. But I think like just having permission to say, you know, that I'm not going to set something up on the table today because mm-hmm. I feel that the kids are going to inhabit the space as their own, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's not like you haven't done anything that there, it, that that takes a lot of trust. It takes a lot of uh, preparing the environment, mm-hmm. making sure it's safe and making sure it's inviting, right. making sure it's accessible. Right. But then like seeing yourself as a re- researcher to understand what their languages are, right? To be curious about what they're going to do, you know, to, to, to really have that relationship, yeah. that relationship of I'm here and I'm interested in what you have yeah. to say. How you're yeah. Gonna move. I think curiosity is a key teacher characteristic to be able to engage in this kind of slow knowledge practice. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I find that it's really difficult for some, some people to let them be, be curious or let themselves be curious or just to, to understand what that means to be curious. Do you, yeah. Is that something you've seen or yeah, I, I experienced agree. or worked with? Yeah. And I think sometimes like if you have, like uh, I work with a lot of new, new teachers. So if we kind of set them up for observation, they can kind of be like, I don't know what I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm looking for. I find that with students too. I have to give them some guidance. You know, I can't just say, go and go and observe and see what you learn about the interactions Mm -hmm. and the emotional environment. You know, I have to have a little something for them to look for. Yeah. 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 So I think the, the more, like you said, the more you observe, yeah. the, the more, the more comfortable you become, um, in that role, the yeah. listening, observing, the better you get at it and the more curious you become, but it does, you do have to feed it. Yeah. And, and it, and it, you know, it might start with just, um, your curiosity, curiosity might be, I wonder what will happen if I don't set anything out this morning. You know, that's, that's being curious that it doesn't it. always have to be an in-depth research question uh, you know, about a specific child and a specific experience or whatever. It can just be that. What if I did one thing differently today? What if I didn't do one thing yeah. that I usually do? Um, how might that change uh, the ecosystem <laughs> or what might that allow me to see differently? Yeah. And ha- maybe you, sometimes I think even like saying like, um, today let's try, let's practice listening. So yeah, what, 
what if you didn't say as much today? Mm -hmm. Like what, what would be going on in your mind if you withheld your language Mm -hmm. um, and didn't speak unless you really had to speak? And then like, maybe they're that first layer of becoming an observer and a listener of children is a very uh, self self awareness. Mm-hmm. Like, wow, that's really hard not to talk. And I talk a lot. Right. And, and then you think about what does that add to the child's experience and environment? If, mm-hmm. if I, if so much of it is just me yeah, offering information or whatever it might yeah. be, or just directing behavior or whatever, but just like becoming aware of, of how much you do talk is like, yeah. Of practicing yeah. how much you move or how quickly you move. Yeah. I move quickly. And I wonder how that affects the child, you know, yeah. in the room because the pace is so connected to this uh this idea yeah. of presence. Yeah. Um oh shoot. I thought I had something. Yeah, I'm looking at the um I mean, I, so this is another uh, quote from that same Sylvia Kind, who was who we quoted before, page thirty-five in the playtime chapter. Yes, I'm on that one too. Yeah, and she says, um, "Learning to walk to his rhythm, to notice the things he notices, and to learn his language and his diverse ways of communicating, of experiencing, and of being in this world, and his unique ways of attending to things, has shaped me more than anyone's research." Mm. Um, and that's sort of a list of smaller steps in that one big thing, like yeah, learning to walk to his rhythm can be symbolic, or it could be really walking at the pace that children are walking when we go from A to B or, um, uh, you know, looking at an individual child's pace and not just thinking about this whole big picture of, of, of my, my day and my schedule noticing the things he notices looking just looking at what they look at you know sometimes is yeah. is an easy small step to start with that's a really good assignment notice things <laughs> what they notice that? yeah yeah <laughs> like, i know it's easy to say and and i think it's very traditional to think about looking at what children are interested in and basing decisions based on that but that leads to stuff like this anecdote i keep using about the teacher who noticed children really enjoyed the water table. And so she decided to do a theme on water conservation. That's not the same thing as noticing what he's looking at in the water table is this, this maybe the splashing of the water wheel as it comes around or the yeah. focus of the pouring, yeah. you know, yeah. that, that changes everything when we look that, yeah. that much more closely and you do kind of have to slow everything down to be able to yes. see that closely. Yes. I, I worked with um, Sonia shop talk a little bit and she would always say like having the, the noticing, what is it about that activity that makes it enlivened and yeah. interesting to the children? So I remember like for her, we were, the kids were, we had a bunch of birds that were coming to the window and the kids were really into it. And so the teachers were ready to launch into like a bird theme, right? Mm-hmm. And interested in bird, we're going to learn about all the birds. Mm-hmm. And she, she was so great about like, spend a few more days just watching what they notice. Yeah. What is it about the bird that is so exciting and enlivening? And like, you, you know, that, that you putting your finger on that yeah. thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, we kind of discovered it was more about this idea because the, we had this big window and they were getting so close yeah. and this idea of being quiet and next to this living creature and yeah. sneaking up, you know? So rather than launch into a, a giant thing about 101 birds, which, you yeah. know, could be, it was more like um, putting out breadcrumbs and looking for their tracks and, yeah. and, and thinking about a, a bird blind and how close we can get to, yeah. to the creatures that live on our planet and how can we attract them? And I don't know, it just kind of changed yeah. the focus. Well, and and we, I think there's also then that pressure that we have to do something with our, obs- with our observation, with the stuff we got. So, mm-hmm. I mean, all of that sounds wonderful. And, you know, there, I definitely have worked with a child who would want to go get the book of a hundred birds yes, and, and look yes. at that. But what, but sometimes maybe it's just talking to them later about mm-hmm. what you noticed about that moment. And that's such a relationship building um, yeah. opportunity then for a you know a small child to in a group of other small children to have a moment when an important adult says um remember when we were looking at that bird yeah and yeah. that connection and that you know he may not consciously think wow carol really gets me 
grandma really was tuned into me, but repeated experiences like that is going to send a message that you're valuable to me and one that of the your ideas that, are worth having. Yes. One of the things that happened in that particular year was that one of the boys started cutting like strips of paper and taping them to his arm. He was making like a bird costume. Oh, he was I, mean, a bird. I love that. I just remember that. It was so fun. It's like, yes. oh, they want to be birds. They They're want to be, be birds. Feathers. Gonna, yeah, right. And um, oh, yeah, just, yeah. Like, you know, slowing it down and 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 seeing how kids interweave this like mm. the excitement and the fantasy and the reality. Like like you said, a couple kids yeah. do want to look at those bird books. Um, yeah. But, but having like being in tune with the children. It's not about our agenda and teaching yeah. all, all the names of birds. There's so many ways, these languages, right? There's so many yeah. ways you're going to learn about birds and, yeah. and the experience is going to take them in so many different directions. Yeah. So um, maybe this is going to put you on the spot, but because I don't know, I haven't read as much about Bruner and the spiral curriculum. Yeah. Just thinking about this, you know, one, one approach is then to do a weekly theme about birds and everything's about birds and everything's different. Every day yeah. has different activities. That's yeah. a, that would be a really traditional, comfortable approach. Um, but, you know, things like I think I'm thinking about the children taping strips of paper. To, that's not a one day, Mm-mm. 15 minute thing. That's going to be going on for a mm-hmm. while. So does that fit with this idea of the spiral curriculum? And I, the, I the think repetition? it does because I think you would, you know, you, I think it does because I think I think with spiral curriculum, you want to think about development, Mm -hmm. development, human growth, and and not just about the content, Uh content. So I think it does interweave with this idea of human development growth, working in spiral, sort of like the gazelle talks about, like there are periods of disequilibrium or periods where you might be gaining knowledge and facts or seeking that other periods where you're sort of breaking the the content or the knowledge apart Mm -hmm. and doing different things with it so how do we continually revisit right yeah um so I have to I have to I have to uh clarify for the any audience members who were also in the same uh track of thinking as I was you were talking about Arnold Gassell G E S E L L thinker of thinker about childhood and not a gazelle. Cause it took me like yes. two seconds to be like, <laughs> wait, is there a gazelle metaphor? I don't know. About. This is uh, yes. Arnold gazelle. Yes. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think about the feedback I got once and this was uh, just not too long ago within is maybe six or seven years ago when I was working with one-year-olds I was working in a one-year-old classroom and about half of them had actually turned two and were waiting for that space to move into the, you know, to be for that permission to be a two-year-old in Mm -hmm. in the two-year-old space. Um, And I had to turn in my lesson plans every week for the whoever to review. And I had the same thing every morning in each box, Mm -hmm. you know, each of the boxes I had to fill out. I had the same thing each morning. And the feedback I got was, um, you can't repeat things like that. You have to have new things every day. Toddlers get very bored with repetition. And you, right. especially you have some of those older toddlers who are, who are getting bored in their space. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I just thought what a misunderstanding, what a yeah. fundamental misunderstanding of how human development really works at this age. Yeah. And, um, what a, what a glimpse into American child care culture and yeah. what it's, what it's tried to, to turn that into. Yeah. And just think like, like this, the spiral being like the complexity of the yeah. material, right? Like, yeah, you have the water table the first week and the next yeah. week you have funnels and the next week you have, you know, gutters and, yeah. and this week you, you go take everything out again because all suddenly they are interested in sponges. Yeah. It's amazing. I don't know. Like, yeah. Like just the depth, the complexity of the material and, yeah. and no, what are the children doing with it and, and being able to have that cycle of inquiry. Wow. This is what they're doing. I wonder yeah. if what they're exploring, we could offer, um, you know, offer mm-hmm. it again in a new yeah. way or keep it offering it again. And, uh, what and, and maybe they really don't, you know, maybe they, maybe they do get bored, but it's yeah. their behavior that should tell us that. And I don't mean mm-hmm. misbehavior. I mean, what we visually can see that observe them doing, mm-hmm. That tells us whether they're they're ready for a new idea or a new activity. Um, I mean, I think I was thinking about as I was was reading part of this, and I can't remember what part, but 
um, they were talking where Allison was talking about um, repetition. And I was thinking about um, like a couple of years ago, one of my favorite bands came out with a new album. And I was very excited because we hadn't had anything new for a while. And I listened and I didn't, I didn't like it right away mm -hmm. uh, because I was comparing it to the old one for one thing. Mm -hmm. But, um, and so I just kind of put it away for a while. And then I listened again and I was like, no way. Each time I I tried it, there was like something different I noticed. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up, you know, really liking it. Uh, but I, I think for me, that was a good analogy of what, what children get when they're allowed to repeat. Yes. And in a, in a kind of unmeasured space of, of time, um, yes. Yes. You know, the, what, what happens the first time gives them a, a baseline experience, but every repetition after that is an opportunity for new information yeah. and new, um, feelings and new, yes. um, connections. And, you know, and we know a little bit from brain research now that that's how those neural connections happen is with the opportunity to repeat the same kinds of things over and over. Um, and you just see like the, the stages, I think that's what I meant by like, by like the developmental piece, the uh -huh. human piece, because if you gave children primary colored paint at the easel every day, all year, right. What they would discover every day would be different. Yeah. Because of their development. Ooh, that's a good one. Right. So you could do a lesson in, you know, October about mixing these colors to make orange, like a pumpkin, yeah. Or you could just let them keep painting, right? Yeah. And becoming masters of this material yeah. and expressing themselves um, with the same material over and over again. And look what they're look at how they're changing in their own development with right. their with their sort of understanding of the page mm -hmm. and the paper and the design and and the representation and their motor skills are developing too. But then there's all these discoveries about the way they're yeah. mixing colors and the yeah. way they're working together the way so it's just like such a such a deep deep spiraling like how you it, you know if you make yeah. that web like how many things did we yeah. learn easel yeah and there's like you know self-regulation or whatever is one of the big buzzwords right now yeah how much how much opportunity do they have for that when they're experiencing it in the way you're describing because they get to I mean they get to regulate their their motions and based on experience but then also you know maybe they don't want the paints mixed and they don't like the color it became so they figure out how to keep it separate, separate. and that's all part of developing self-regulation it's not all about compliance and yeah, that's and, so true and the misbehavior yeah. it's 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 experiencing over a period of time that you can uh control aspects mm. that mm. that maybe aren't yeah. working for you yeah. um and and make adjustments that bring it closer to working for you. Right. I was also thinking when you were talking about repetition is one, the one job I had when I was young was at a nature, little nature center uh -huh. and the kids, I would meet the kids in the parking lot and um, we had a little meeting spot and the parents would all say goodbye. And I had to walk down this trail every day to this little cabin. It was a, uh -huh. lovely, a lovely place to teach in the woods um, <laughs> in Northern Florida. So that every single day we walk down this path, right? And just me and the kids, me and eight kids walking down this path to this little cabin. And and what what a rich, like talk about trying to pause and mm -hmm. tear and the kind of things that we would find on our way to the cabin and uh, how, how things would change from day to day. Uh -huh. how they would want to revisit something they saw the day before, just like that repetition. And then, then I feel like that was for me, just a golden moment of trying yeah. to, trying to live the child's pace. And then also thinking of that walk from the parking lot to the cabin. I, I often thought like, wouldn't it be great if we thought about our early childhood places as being have having a portal like passing through a portal oh. like that it feels different for yeah. everyone like if everyone came into my school and felt like this feels different what is it the time is <laughs> it's the pace it's the yeah. child's pace it's the child's world like how could we like invite people to step into a different time portal yeah. where we are in tune with children yeah. No, that gave me shivers. That's oh. a beautiful image, a beautiful, uh, uh aspiration. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, I've gotten through all my post-it notes. Did you have other okay. spots no, that you wanted great. to bring in? I think in? it's a great part one. I, yeah. I, I really recommend the book. And yeah. I think everyone will take something different in terms of thinking. Sure, about yeah. Apply the slower. Sure. And I mean, I mean, we were kind of heavy on the um, on the actual clock part. Yeah. Um, but, you know, she talks about play and um, uh, there's a whole section about play that we didn't really yeah. dive all that deep into yet. Yeah, play having flow, right? Play yeah, having, you know, that magical quality of time. Yeah, that is again that that gift that the children come into the earth with, like just being able to be absorbed in their own play. Yeah, and and figuring out how to as adults fit into that. And we had a new child come to our school this year and he came from a, a, a very different program. And then he came into our play-based program and the teacher was like, oh my gosh, he has such a hard time with cleanup and moving uh -oh. to the next he goes, he hasn't figured out that all we do next is play. <laughs> play, 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 play. And he, just, he hasn't figured out that the next thing is still play. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So that makes so sense. Uh, uh, poor little guy. In the beginning, like the, I think because going to that practical thing in this book is what yeah. I love going to that yeah. practical, the schedule, the flow, the, the, the pace mm -hmm. and then zooming back out to like the bigger symbolic philosophical yeah. stuff, about the hurried pace of childhood. Mm -hmm. And then, and like you said, at the beginning, robbing, robbing children of their childhood because mm -hmm. of this pressure people yeah. feel this push down. It's, 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 it's intense and, yeah. and and, and, and we have to be guardians of the children's time. And, right. and I think it's powerful to have language like slow right. knowledge. <laughs> yeah, I do too. So just, when we, when we had the, the sleepover, um, Bethany ca kept calling the book slow knowledge and I kept correcting her and telling her, no, it's slow. <laughs> <laughs> like for two days, she let me do that. And then just like, show <laughs> I was like, dang. <laughs> so, um, uh, but it worked out. It worked out. I just, you know, you know, I, I'm all for having, you know, fewer adults going to prison and and children having better elementary school experiences and and uh, having better, you know, chances at living wages as they get older and you know, all the things that we say early childhood promises um but it's it's this tendency to instead of look at the societal factors that contribute to all those things and yeah. only hooking it to what whether they were um pushed into academics early enough yeah. really really just as you know sits sits so heavy on me and this book is really really presents a compelling case for figuring out a different way than yes. the current than the current yes. way so slow what she says slow is resistance right yes slow is resistance yeah and is yeah. definitely a way to defend childhood mm -hmm. yeah so um we'll talk about it again but thanks allison clark <laughs> thanks allison clark i miss you bethany i'm for sorry you yeah well. we'll get yeah. her again we'll get her for the for part two um but, and thank you carol i've missed uh your brain <laughs> You know, we've got these chats that we have on Facebook or text or whatever, but it, there's just nothing like sitting here looking at each other and having it's these a luxury. It's such yeah. a luxury to have yeah. people to talk to about the yeah, things. We I appreciate you. You do it for so many people. You put it in the world <laughs> for all of us. Um, oh, that's so. nice of you. Yeah. So that feels like a good spot to end. <laughs> if we're going to start complimenting people. me, this has to be over. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Carol. And thanks everybody for listening to another episode of that early childhood nerd. Goodbye.